kids. In fact, I forgot this microphone this morning, so I had to get up and go back there again. Have you found Acts chapter 2? If you found Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 41 through 47 this morning. These are verses of scripture that are oftentimes used prior to a revival. Uh, they describe the people coming to know Jesus. Uh, in fact, they describe 3,000 souls being added to, to God's church. But this morning, I want us to think about something else. This morning, I want us to think about how the church is growing in our society today. One of the things that I, I read about more than anything, and again, I, I need to tell you that I do read a little, even though my wife tells you that I don't. Uh, Occasionally, I'll see a picture and say the church doesn't grow very well. But uh, one of the concerns for most pastors and one, one of the concerns for uh, most of the major religions of our, our society today is the fact that churches are on the decline. There's a, uh, it seems like a worldwide epidemic that, uh, that churches are on the decline. A lot of people have given it give an indication as to why they think that's the, that's the truth. But ultimately, there, it, it boils down to one thing. It boils down to this, that God's people are in tune with God, so therefore the churches are prospering. I don't know whether you would agree with me or not, uh, but I want you to consider the fact that in order for people to come to know Jesus Christ and to have a, a good relationship with God, the church has to be involved in it. Jesus died for the church. I've had people tell me, so, well, I can have church in my home by myself. No, you can't. I've had people tell me that I can worship watching the television. No, you can't. When God called his people together and called them into the church, he was actually speaking about a group of people who gathered together to gain strength from each other and to worship and serve him. And ultimately, when that was accomplished, they, their duty was to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel people to come to know Jesus Christ. Savior Lord. Now if you are a Christian this morning, you know exactly how hard it is uh, to live in our society today. You know that, that there are stressors that people just don't understand unless you truly know God as your, as, as, uh, as your master and you know, know Jesus as your Savior. Unless you know that, you really don't understand the stressors that are placed on true Christians in our society today. And it comes to, uh, to my mind that you and I, if we know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then we're going to have to buck up and be strong. And the only way that we can be strong is to have a, a, a support system, which is the church, standing behind us, praying for us each day, and we, do, and we do the same for others. So the church is very important. I want us to read this, these verses of Scripture, verses 41 through 47. And we're going to look at some of the reasons why the church isn't growing today that are found in these verses. I also want you to un understand that standing still and stagnation are not normal for the church. In fact, when you look at the first century church, you see that believers were added to that church almost daily. Here's what Acts chapter 2 verses 41 through 47 has to say. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, they, with one accord, and that's not a Honda car, by the way, 
in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The church, not a stagnant, not a still institution or a group of people. The first century church added people to its numbers each day. When we look at the church and we take a hard look at our church and we take a hard look at ourselves, I want to give you a few little things found in these verses of Scripture that we could do better and we could see our church and the churches throughout this country grow. So if you want to take notes, that's fine. If you don't, you can remember that's fine too. If you just don't care, that's fine also. But here's number one. The number one reason that the church is not prospering today is the lack of steadfastness. Look at verse 42. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread. I've heard in the last few years, Judy talked talk to me about it the other night, a phrase called the new normal. Y'all heard that? The new normal. And there seems to be in our country a new normal for just about everything. But I want you to understand something this morning. If you carry away nothing else but this, I want you to understand this. There is no new normal in God's Word. It is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You may wish it would change. You may try to change it. But there is no new normal for the church. When the writer of Acts made the statement and they continued steadfastly. Here's what he was talking about. The word steadfast means to, to be firmly fixed. Immovable. In our society today, we're very movable. We have the idea, and it's pervasive in our society, that we have to be politically correct. Y'all know what that is? That essentially means telling somebody that uh, that you're not lost, you're a misguided. I don't even know where that's going It's accepting or not speaking out against religions who have no connection to Jesus Christ as being Savior and Lord. Politically correct means that we accept almost anything that comes down the pike because we don't want to make anyone feel bad. I just wonder how bad they're going to feel when they're standing in the middle of hell and the flames are leaping up around them. God's people are no longer steadfast. We move, we give, we take. And we're not really following what God would have us to follow because we want everybody to feel good. I sure wish I could make you feel good when you leave this room. 
I wish I could, could pep you up and have you energized. But you know the, the, the duty that I have is not to really make you feel good, but to warn you that Satan is at work in this world. He will ruin your life if you give him a chance, and he will take your soul to hell if you don't accept Jesus Christ as Savior Lord. I wish I could make you feel good. By the way, if I warn you and you escape hell, you ought to feel good. You ought to be feeling the best in your life. You should feel like that you're on cloud nine with no problems in the world because you don't have a problem in the world, a real problem, if you have Jesus as your Savior. Your problems have been taken away. The only real problem that we have that we need to deal with effectively and, and concisely with is sin. And when we deal with that and we are steadfast in what God would have us to do, we're going to not only cure our problem, but we're going to make everybody else feel good too. God's people have to be steadfast. Fix firmly. Many times we know what to do, but when it comes to doing it, we abandon ship. I took a little test the other day. They're, they're going to make us, they're having a group of us go to a, some kind of a communications class that deals with conflict, how to, how to, deal, how to deal with conflict effectively. And I told them I didn't, think, I didn't need to go to that class. I've been dealing with Baptist churches for 40 something years. I've seen it all. <laughs> been there and done that. But you have to take a test. And you know something? When, when I got through with that test and, and evaluated it, I found out that I do exactly what most of you do we avoid conflict. If we know that something is going to, to shake, rattle, and roll somebody's world, if we say something about it, we will avoid it. We don't want to make anyone mad. We, we try our best to not make anyone mad. Now, there are a few people in the world that don't care. I mean, they'll just tell you like it is. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but they'll just tell you like, like they think it is. But most of us will avoid that conflict. Now, it may not be so bad if you're dealing with your wife, because you sure don't want to be in conflict too much with your wife. But you sure need to be in conflict when it has to do with somebody's soul, or it has to do with the, the wiles of Satan, or it has to do with, with something that's going to affect people's uh, spiritual life. We need to be steadfast. But when it comes to doing that, we abandon ship. And because of the fact that you and I as Christian people are, are not being as steadfast as we should be, we're not reaping the harvest that God has out there. Churches over the years have tried a lot of things. They've tried... I'm convinced that you feed Baptists, they'll come. I, I, think, I think that's a good thing for Baptists. Uh, our, our Methodist brethren are just the same way. But the one thing that we all need to remember is that the church is not about feeding us physically, it's about feeding us spiritually. <coughs> And when a church ceases to feed people spiritually, it's not going to draw those people to Jesus. I remember reading in the Baptist Reflector about a little church in, in Tennessee that uh, was having problems and it, it was going down the tubes fast. And so what they did, and I've told you this story before, what they did was eliminate all of their programs. Except Sunday school and preaching. And they began to put their, their efforts into those two areas. And what happened was, the church didn't see phenomenal growth, but it began to grow. And as it grew, guess what? 
The people were more grounded in God's word than they were before they tried that. And they kept growing and growing. And they began to pick up a, a little bit and began to see people come and begin to see people know Jesus Christ as Savior Lord. Folks, I'm convinced that you and I need to be steadfast in a few things, and one of them is the presentation of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, both from the pulpit and from the Sunday school classes. If we're not teaching God's Word in those two places, we're not being steadfast in God's service. The second thing that I want you to see is that they, uh, there was a lack of prayer. In that same verse, it says, and they continued steadfastly, and then the last part of that verse says, in prayer. Someone has said that if the church is going to advance, if the church is going to move forward, it's going to advance on her knees. Do you ever get on your knees and pray? Have you ever thought that maybe it's time that you as a child of God have calluses on your knees because of the time that you spend in prayer? How much more that would happen? If God's people are going to see people born into God's kingdom, it's going to be a result of prayer. Now we pray. We pray over our food. We pray a little prayer in church. We pray a little prayer sometimes during our quiet time. But have you ever thought of just how much your prayer could mean to someone if you just mentioned their name? Most of the time we use bless those that are lost. Bring the lost to Jesus. I pray for those that are lost. I'll bet you anything that most of you know someone that's lost, at least one person. And if you know at least one person that's lost, the best way to get them into the fold of God is by praying for them. I've had people tell me, ladies, ladies, Lady, one lady had told me one time that she had been praying for her husband for years. You know what happens? One day her husband came and acknowledged Jesus Christ as her, his personal Savior. Now it didn't happen overnight. In fact, they were married for quite a while. But she never gave up on praying for him. She never gave up on being a witness to him. She never gave up on being faithful to her church so that she, she could show him what it was to be a Christian. And God rewarded her with her husband coming to know Jesus. If you don't get what you ask for, keep on asking. But you know we don't have the we don't have the audacity or the longevity that, that we're we're going to pray and keep on praying for that one thing. You know how, and I've told you this, I do most of the ordering work. Somebody will come in and, and tell me, so we, we need this. If they tell me one time, I don't pay any attention to it. I pay absolutely no attention to it. Because I'm always having somebody come in and say, we need this. If they come back the second time and say, we need this, I know they're, they're interested just a little bit. If they come back the third 
church now, I know that they really need. Are you persistent in prayer? Do you find yourselves on your knees asking God this is what we need. This is what I need. And it's not wrong to ask for what you need because let me tell you something. God is going to give you exactly what you need. I thought about asking for a couple of million dollars one day. <coughs> I figured I'd only get a dollar or two. The problem is that we sometimes think that God is going to give us exactly what we want. Remember this. God gives you what you need. God gives you what you need. And He gives it to you through prayer. <clears throat> Every failure that the church has Every failure that you have as a Christian is a direct result of failure in prayer. And it's because you haven't been on your knees. When Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, he indicated that praying always was God's plan for the church. And prayer that never gives up was actually taught by Jesus. Look, you look in verse uh, Luke first, chapter 18, verse 1. He said, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. If you pray and you're not ready to receive what God is going to give you, you're praying in vain. Prayer is the glue that holds God's people together. The third thing. The third thing is lack of spiritual. In Acts chapter 2 verse 45 it says this. We read it. And they sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as anyone had need. Y'all think that would work for that? I don't think it would work for that. It would. It really would. But there's an element that is missing in our society that would make it fail if we didn't really have God's leadership. You know what that what that is? Is grief. People are grief. If we sold everything that we had and, and divided it above all as anyone had need, what do you really need? You need food, water, shelter.
Are you a good steward of your time? I like to see people that tell the truth. We're not really good stewards of our time. Our oldest son has three kids. And their whole week is involved in soccer, baseball, softball, practice. The middle girl is playing softball. She practices three nights a week, plays three nights a week, practices one night a week. And these parents just think that's normal. They run from pillar to post. And that may be okay. But let me tell you what's something. And I'm going to use my my family as an example, not that they actually do this, but I'm going to just use them as an example. They're they're kind of they're tied up all week long. <coughs> but do you know what suffers when people are tied up? It's not softball. <coughs> not soccer. It's not baseball. It's the church. If something is going to kill, it's going to be the church. We use the church's time, or God's time, as a cushion. It cushions those things that we, we need to, to, to work around. We'll go and, and we'll do everything else by the book, but when it comes down to, to God's time, Hey, that's fair game. I don't have to pray. The only person at that church that has to come is a preacher that because we pay him to be there. How about our talents? There's some talented people in this church. And I'm going to use Lakewood as an example. There's some talented people in this church, but most of you are sitting on your talents and not doing a thing with them. Just going to be honest. You're not using your talents to the fullest of your ability. And when we don't use our talents, now some people will argue that the word talent here means money. That's fine. You're not using your money as it should be used. Either way you want to go, it doesn't matter to me. You're not using your money. You're not using your abilities. You're not using what God has blessed you with to bless this church and to bless God and to see people born into the kingdom of heaven. How about your treasures? Now we're going to talk about money. Somebody said, Preacher, you've got to quit preaching and gone to bed and when you start talking about money. The money you have in your pocket today or in your bank account today or in your 401k today or in your retirement plan today doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. Amen. <coughs> and He can take it away just as easily as He gave it. You can, you can be the richest man one minute and the poorest man the next minute. What are you doing with your treasures? In fact, let me ask you this question. What are your treasures? Is it your boat? Is it your iPhone? What, is, what are your treasures today? Your treasures should be those things that God has given you and you are a good steward of those. Not only to your family and to your church, but to the world. How about one last thing? Testimony. <clears throat> one of the greatest gifts that God has given a Christian is his testimony. And let me tell you something, folks. It doesn't have to be a flowery testimony. It doesn't have to have to go into the fact that, that you were a drug dealer and a drug addict for 20 years and, and in the middle of, of uh, your rehabilitation or in the middle of a, a, a gun battle somewhere, Jesus Christ came into your heart and life and changed your life. Hey, that's a, that's a good story. That's a good testimony. And it would get people to listen. But the one thing that you don't have may be that testimony. You may have the fact that you were
were saved in the pew one Sunday night or you were saved like my dad in a, in a cedar ticket one day. And that's your testimony. Use it for what God intended you to use it. And that is to bring other people to the realization that they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We need to be good stewards of our testimony. Folks, that early church grew by leaps and bounds because they applied the biblical truths involving stewardship. They relied on each other. They draw, drew strength from each other. And they did steadfastly what was necessary to glorify God and to worship Him. So, are you guilty this morning? Are you guilty of having a lack of steadfastness? How about a lack of prayer? Or a lack of spiritual? Without those three things, God's church just won't grow. If God's people aren't steadfast, prayed up, and good students of the things that God has given. When we do those things, you'll see people come to realize that Jesus Christ needs to be Lord of their life. God will bless when we will let Him be our leader, our Lord, our Savior. Father, thank you for Jesus. <clears throat> thank you for his sacrifice and thank you for your great love. Now, Heavenly Father, help us to, to see that somewhere along the line we've let some very important things slide. We're not steadfast in our beliefs anymore. Certainly not the right that we should be. And sometimes we're not very good stewards of what we give us. Father, I pray this morning that you would convict the Christians that are here in this church today of any shortcoming that we might have. And Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, give us the desire correct those things with your help and your guidance. That we can be a better example of what God's people should be. But Father, I also pray that if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that they just won't write that opportunity off because we do such a poor job sometimes. But that right now, Heavenly Father, you're using the Holy Spirit to draw them to Jesus. And I hope and pray that they'll see that opportunity of love and mercy and grace that Jesus so abundantly offers. Father, I pray this morning as we sing this invitation song that if our hearts are right with you, that we'll get them right before we leave. <coughs> Heavenly Father, draw us near to you, cause us to see our shortcomings, Father. <coughs> Cause us to have the courage to step up to the plate and hit a home run for you. Father, I pray that you bless this invitation now and use it for your honor and your glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If God has spoken to you this morning, whatever he might be saying to you through the Holy Spirit, however he might be, if you feel you need to come, won't you do so as we stand and say,